joining us this afternoon. I'm really looking forward um, to the conversation with today's presenters, Christina and Kate. Um, I'm going to share a few housekeeping items and do a little bit of an intro before passing it off to the two of them. Um, for the health equity webinars, I typically request that people keep their videos and microphones turned off during the presentation. Uh, that'll let you use the hide non-video participants feature um, so you can spotlight the speakers. We'll have 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask Christina or Kate, uh, please put those in the chat. My name is Natalia Mason. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist in the Division of Social Accountability. I am joining today uh, from the College of Medicine's main campus in Saskatoon. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Division of Social Accountability is a division of the College of Medicine dedicated to health equity, anti-racist education, community-based research, advocacy, authentic partnerships, and the health needs of underserved and marginalized communities. We engage with and learn from our communities to support relevant, meaningful, and impactful health professional education, research, service, and advocacy. We offer our health equity webinar series to support our students, faculty, and staff in their learning in the College of Medicine, touching on some of the priority health needs of those in the community. Our webinars are always open invite, so I would really encourage you to spread the word to friends and colleagues. Um, we also always post our webinars online, so if you've missed out on something in the past and you're curious, you can find those on YouTube, and I'll share a link when I've got a second here. I'm really excited to introduce this afternoon's guests. Christine and Kate are um, both friends, if I might be so bold, um, and also colleagues uh, from the CLRC. Um, they've also been really actively engaged in our anti-racist transformation in medical education um, project. And so I look forward to hearing about some of the ways that that work has been carried through the college um, and um, influenced other areas of learning for health science students at the University of Saskatchewan. Christina is a neurodivergent uh, cis straight Canadian who spent the majority of her life living and working on Treaty 6 land. She is a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Theatre from the University of Saskatchewan and between 2003 and 2018 she worked exclusively as an independent artist. After attending the School of Hard Knocks she pivoted by earning her MBA and joining the team at the Clinical Learning Resource Centre as a simulated patient program coordinator where she puts her passion for social justice to work. In her spare time, Christina enjoys forest bathing, restoring vintage furniture, gardening, and spending time with her partner and 16-year-old daughter, as well as the tiniest dictator in the home, her four-year-old miniature dashend. Is that how you say that word? Okay. Weenie dog for uh, those <laughs> less familiar. Um, and Kate. Uh, Kate is a simulated patient educator who was born in Regina, Saskatchewan. She's a cis, straight, fifth-generation Canadian and a white settler on Treaty 6 territory. Her first career was in theatre, and between 2010 and 2019, she performed and produced professional shows in and around Saskatoon. For the past eight years, Kate has also been teaching female breast and pelvic exams to medical learners as a sensitive exam teaching associate, and has been teaching new CETAs in her role as a project lead for the GTA, or a gynecological teaching associate program at the CLRC. Outside of work, Kate has been learning Spanish, improving her birding skills, sponsoring a small group of Afghan refugees, and organizing for climate justice, most recently with Climate Justice Saskatoon. Um, I'm so excited for everyone to get to hear from the two of them. The CLRC does such neat work. It's my favorite place uh, to go distract myself when I have other things on my desk. Um, and so I'm sure that everyone's gonna be really um, amazed by the work that they've had going on there and kind of how widespread the impact of that work is um, for the people of Saskatchewan. And with that, I will pass it over to the two of you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm just gonna get my screen sharing going here. Alrighty. Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk. And thank you, everyone for giving us a little bit of your time today. Um, Kate and I really love the work that we do. And we really like talking about it. Um, so thank you to the DSA for inviting us to speak and to Natalia for being the CLRC's number one fan girly. Um, so I'm Christina, I'm the simulated patient program coordinator at the Clinical Learning Resource Center. Your screen. What, what, my screen? It's, it's not showing sure. the other one. Oh, it's showing the other one? Okay, hang on, hang on. I 
definitely didn't mean to do that. There you go. That's better. Woohoo! All right. Are you going to introduce yourself, Kate? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm Kate Harriet, Simulated Patient Educator at the CLRC. Um, we wanted to start off with a brief introduction and a statement of positionality just to clarify how our identities relate to our topic today. First, we wish to acknowledge that the land we are joining from is Treaty 6 territory and that all of us now living here are Treaty people. This land is the traditional meeting ground and homeland of the First Nations, including Cree, Soto, Dene, Nakoda, Lakota, Dakota, as well as the Métis Nation. We express our appreciation for the opportunity to teach and learn on this territory with the understanding that this place has a living history of Indigenous ways of knowledge sharing. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So a little bit about me. I've lived in Saskatoon Treaty 6 uh, since the time I was about seven. I obtained my BFA here at the U of S. And then I did go on to have a relatively fulfilling career as an independent theater artist. Um, at some point, though, the rose colored glasses came off and I realized that I wasn't having the impact on my community that I thought I was having. Um, I had also become a single mother. I had no pension, no benefits, no savings, and I was earning below the poverty line. And I just thought this, this cannot be it for me. I had been working with the CLRC to in some capacity since about 2009. And then in 2018, a position opened up and I pivoted. So I used my tuition subsidy and a scholarship and my APA funds to get an MBA. And I haven't looked back. Uh, I do find that this work has much more of a tangible impact on my community. Um, I'm a straight, cis, neurodivergent white woman raising a queer, neurodivergent teenager. And I worry about the world that my daughter is growing up in. I fear for her safety as a queer person. Um, and I also acknowledge the intersectionality and complexity of identity, and I'm I'm committed to doing what I can to dismantle the power structures that harm everyone. For myself, I was born in Regina on Treaty 4. I got a BFA in theater and moved to Saskatoon in 2011. I followed a very similar path to Christina's, first into the SP program, taking simulated patient shifts in between theater gigs, moving up to a trainer role, and then taking on a permanent position when it became available. I specialize in training SPs to deliver feedback to learners and in the highly technical training required for the exceptionally standardized tests we deliver for national pharmacy licensing exams. I am a straight white cis woman with a post-secondary education and a stable middle-class income. I am also a member of the tenant class, neurodivergent, a victim of sexual violence, and for the first half of my life, I had a physical disability. The layering of my identities gives me a critical lens on how healthcare is distributed, and it has made me especially protective of underserved communities. These lenses are also biases that I have to be aware of when working within an EDI framework. So today, we will use a, for a few terms that are relatively isolated to simulation, so I wanted to preview them now so you know what we're talking about later. When we talk about the CLRC, that's our Clinical Learning Resource Center here. SP means simulated participant or simulated patient or standardized patient. These are interchangeable terms that we use in SIM. SPP is our simulated patient program. SPE is a simulated patient uh, educator, which I am. OSCE is an observed structured clinical experience. So it's like the medical exams that a lot of our learners do. And ASPE is the Association of Standardized Patient Educators. There are also a number of academic publications we rely on fairly regularly to inform our practice. One of such is the ASPE Standards of Best Practice, which is a document that provides guidance on best practice for all SP programs or SPPs. Other source materials are available if you're interested. Uh, while, we'll, while we will be referencing academic resources throughout this talk, none of the photos are stock images. Every face you see is a real member of the CLRC, Learners, instructors, staff, and simulated participants, all used with permission. Um, 
Just a quick note about questions. We will take questions after the presentation, so please write them down so you don't forget. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff. Um, if it's easier to just like think of your question and put it in the chat, that's also fine, Natalia. Thank you, Natalia. We'll be monitoring the chat so we can address them all at the end. Awesome. All righty. So it's been well documented that simulation education does increase patient safety in the healthcare system from practicing invasive maneuvers like intubation um, to breaking bad news. Simulation education allows learners the opportunity to reach competency prior to working with patients in real life situations. It allows them to be unsuccessful in a safe environment. In fact, freedom to fail is the cornerstone of simulation. So why then does EDI matter in simulation education? Well, we often talk about um, with SPs about the responsibility and honor of being a proxy for patients, strangers out there, vulnerable folks who need care, uh, whose care is made better by an interaction that they may have had with um, you, the SP. And it's that, yes, but they are also patients. I am a patient, you are a patient. Anyone has the capacity to be a patient. It's not always abstract, someone out there somewhere. It's us and it's our loved ones. And I think I can speak for most of our SPs when I say that um, we all have a little bit of stake in the game and it's what drives us to do our best work. Um, and I think we can also agree that safety isn't always equally distributed within the healthcare system. So building an SP population that is representative as possible is one tangible thing that we can do to counteract that injustice. Using an EDI framework to build that representative population is the only way to accomplish that um, if we're seeking meaningful and sustainable transformative change. So the Clinical Learning Resource Center, or CLRC is what we call it, um, is an interprofessional simulated healthcare facility. So to get a really thorough understanding of today's topic, we do have to lay a little groundwork about the CLRC and about simulation education and healthcare specifically. So bear with us. Um, if you're already familiar with the work of the CLRC, this will be a good reminder. Um, so the CLRC aims to improve patient safety and quality of patient care um, by providing a safe learning environment where learners can develop a large breadth of skills uh, through experiential learning. We partner with most health science colleges, including both undergraduate and postgraduate medicine, nursing, pharmacy and nutrition, the School of Rehab Sciences, and even veterinary medicine. Simulation-based education is absolutely not unique to healthcare. Uh, it's simply defined as a technique to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences, um, often immersive in nature, that evoke or replicate aspects of the real world in an interactive fashion. So we focus on three main modalities of simulation as well as their hybrids, high fidelity mannequins, low fidelity task trainers, and simulated participants. And when we talk about fidelity um, in this context, it just means the degree to which it mimics human physiology. So the closer it is to the way that our human bodies work, the closer or the higher fidelity it is. So with high fidelity mannequins, um, they're designed for practicing crisis management situations. Um, we have a lot of sims in anesthesia, obstetrics, emergency medicine. The mannequins can simulate breathing and blinking. They have measurable vital signs. They can be intubated and defibrillated in addition to many other um, invasive procedures that we would never do on a human patient. In simulation, <laughs> I should say. Um, and then low fidelity task trainers are designed for learning technical skills. So like IV starts, pelvic and rectal exams, injections, chest tube placement, that sort of thing. Um, it feels often like we have endless task trainers. And then the third modality and the one that we're going to be talking about today is a simulated participant. Uh, so I think it's important to acknowledge that diversity is still really important within all three modalities. Um, and if anybody wants, we can talk about the work that's being done in the other two. Um, 
but it's just that the simulated patient program is the modality within our sphere of influence. So that's what we're discussing today. So the simulated patient program grew from what used to be called the volunteer patient program, where it was actually like just volunteers. Um, they were largely from the retired population. And although um, we'll be forever grateful to their uh, contributions in those early days, the program itself um, was much less, for, much, much less formalized than it is today. Today, we have nearly 200 individuals ranging from 18 to 86 years old, uh, plus a thriving pediatric volunteer patient program. And they are all intensely unique individuals. The only quality shared between them is their desire to be of service to learners. So what exactly does a simulated patient do, Kate? Well, a simulated patient is a person who's been carefully coached to simulate an actual patient so accurately that the simulation cannot be detected by a skilled clinician. SPs are community members from all walks of life, and above all, SPs are vital members of the education team. No specific training or previous work history is necessary to be an SP, but they are given training that's specific to the role they've been recruited for, so they're able to calibrate and standardize their role portrayal. SPs are utilized to help achieve learning objectives, for example, communication skills development, including patient histories, uh, demonstrating non-invasive physical exam procedures, or a combination of both. And these skills may be as a part of a formative learning session or a high-stakes summative evaluation. At our Sim Center, we also have a program that is near and dear to our hearts, the Sensitive Exam Teaching Associate Program, or CETA. CETAs are male and female individuals who are trained to teach learners how to perform sensitive exams, such as breast, pelvic, urological, and rectal examinations, and they guide the learners while this exam is being performed on their own anatomy. They also provide real-time feedback to the students on exam technique, communication skills, and patient rapport during these sensitive exams. So I just want to reiterate that we are a service unit, so a service organization um, for all of health sciences. That said, not all colleges utilize our program to the same degree. Much of the support the SP program delivers does go to the College of Medicine, so we're very familiar with their specific curriculum mandates. Um, the <clears throat> College of Medicine uh, has protected both tangible and intangible resources to build a more culturally safe learning environment. And since the SPP simulated patient program plays a significant role in the educational journey of learners, uh, we're thrilled to be able to leverage these changes to align with the college's strategic direction. However, um, simulated patient programs like ours don't create curriculum. Uh, we just support and deliver it. Each college creates case content based on curriculum requirements with the learning objectives built into the content. As, as SP educators, it's our responsibility to interpret the learning objectives and train simulated patients to help students meet them. Then um, SPs role play the scenario with students while a faculty preceptor guides and mentors. Um, at this point, I think it's helpful to understand how we cast and hire SPs for sessions. Um, so first, we get case content that's written for a specific skill competency. Um, for example, taking a psychiatric history or a focused history for a patient presenting with pelvic pain, like in the following example. You're a 25-year-old person who identifies as female, and you have been referred to a gynecologist from your family doctor with a one-year history of pelvic pain. So what can we tell from this that helps us recruit? Well, we know that we need a female SP, and in this case, we're talking about anatomy, who looks to be about 25. Uh, and after reading through the case, we'll know more about role requirements. Is there content that might deal with difficult subject matter like pregnancy loss, sexual assault, or domestic violence? Is there a physical exam? Um, and if there is, are there findings? Is there a difficult emotional affect? We take all that information and we narrow down our SP list to those who meet the demographic criteria and have the skill set to portray that scenario 
and have already stated that they're comfortable with that type of content. We send out the shift option to those SPs and they self-select in or out based on their interest and availability. Uh, so to some extent, we don't actually have that much control in the end over who ends up in the sessions other than to carefully curate the initial list uh, to ensure that statistically there will be some diversity within the final group. So despite working pretty hard to ensure that students are interacting with culturally and socially diverse patient population, um, people just aren't always available and therefore it's ultimately out of our hands. Uh, but we'll talk more about how we compensate for that a little later on when we talk about data. So <clears throat> the curricular mandates of our college partners necessitate EDI work, but if we don't create the curriculum, how does the CLRC as a service organization interpret and deliver the mandates responsibly and ethically? And that's the big thing for us. So the SP program is responsible for more than just recruitment and training of SPs for sessions. Uh, we're privy to formative and summative content across all colleges. And as a unit, we collaborate on case development, um, OSCE cases, that sort of thing. Um, we advise clients on best practice. We provide equipment and we do set up for every event that takes place within the CLRC and some that take place elsewhere. Um, we use the same framework to evaluate case content regardless of the client, and we also use the same SP pool regardless of the client. So naturally, um, understanding the nuances of each college is really critical for us to ensure that we are meeting their needs as a service organization. SPs are more than just bodies in beds, and we're really careful around the language that we use when we're talking about the work that they do. They are the living embodiment of course content. They're a proxy for patients, um, which means they are absolutely part of the educational team. They too identify learning objectives, and part of their professional development is learning that there is a technique involved um, with helping students meet learning objectives. They become familiar with interpreting scoring rubrics. They also have a familiarity with core competencies for each learner year. They become experts in listening and responding, in knowing which lever to pull to help students meet learning objectives. All right. So as far as how uh, diversity ends up in SP sessions, we think of it as being either scripted or unscripted. And what we mean by that is either diversity is scripted, where it is built into the content of the session itself, like a case that has been written for a Black patient whose skin rash has been misdiagnosed by doctors unfamiliar with deeper skin tones. Or that diversity is unscripted, where learners are constantly interacting with a diverse range of SPs, just like they will out in practice, where the case content is not directly related to the patient's cultural or social identity. So an example of that would be hiring a trans person for a session that's just about knee pain. Uh, so for scripted diversity, there's a couple of reasons why that kind of content is used in simulation. Going back to those curricular mandates that Christina referenced, healthcare learners are required to be trained in issues around health inequities and effective communication with diverse patients. The goal of simulation education is to tackle these conversations in a safe learning environment where learners can make mistakes without harming vulnerable patients. Scripted diversity is a way to build simulations that at their core address EDI issues like social determinants of health, barriers to access, et cetera, or simply to counteract the assumption that there is some kind of default patient. At our site, the scripted diversity mostly comes to us in the form of case content. Our clients have case writers, will build a specific OSCE case or advanced communications case that is centered around an EDI learning objective. We then recruit demographically appropriate SPs and include in their training any related conversations necessary to help them deliver the content. Now, there are some potential harms in using scripted diversity. Cases that center around a social or cultural issue are rarely fun and light. They put all participants in a position where they could be alienated, stereotyped, or triggered. As Pickett's, Warren, and Bonert state, we must be aware of the, quote, potential for psychological harm when patients are asked to bring their appearance, identity, or lived experience into simulation, end quote. 
It doesn't mean we shouldn't study cases that have difficult content, but when learners only see SPs in the context of cases where their cultural or social identity is the focus, it then reduces those patients to their perceived identity in the eyes of the students, and the patient's identity is pathologized. As one respondent to the SAS Human Rights Commission's investigation noted, queer content, for example, is rare. And when it does show up, it's pathologized. Quote, wow, it turns out this student is gay. Wow, they must have a mood disorder, that sort of thing, end quote. We've also found that scripted diversity content can often be written assuming that the learner is the one in the position of privilege. For example, they're white or straight or they're just not a minority. This assumption perpetuates a white centric worldview and is also just inaccurate given the actual demographics among health science learners. This creates isolating and hurtful situations where, for example, a Muslim student is assigned to a case where they're being taught to be culturally sensitive towards a patient who's observing Ramadan. So, okay, then how do you mitigate risk for the students, the SPs, and the population you're attempting to represent? There are some things we've learned from our experiences and others, things you can keep on your radar while creating content. A big thing is to share your power. Bring in RSB educators. We pilot and workshop cases regularly. We can collaborate on content to help identify potential harms. Also, engage the community. Ensure that folks with lived experience are invited to contribute their voices to the content. Watch out for pathologizing, tokenizing, or otherwise reducing someone's identity to absolutes or even just to a sufficient description. This means you must not attempt to write the content in an academic silo. Even when you're writing a patient story that's reflecting your own life experiences, we know that no community is a monolith and no one community member should be expected to speak for the entire community. From ASPE's standards of best practices on safe work practices, Domain 2.1.3 says to, quote, ensure that cases are based on authentic problems and respect the individuals represented in a case to avoid bias or stereotyping marginalized populations, end quote. Another thing to keep in mind is that language really matters. A great example of this is when cases are written for a standardized patient where genders are relevant to the station. So then the case writer puts she slash he instead of they or simply the patient. This perpetuates the idea that as far as medicine is concerned, a patient is either A or B and excludes patients who are non-binary or genderqueer. The same thing happens when a patient's spouse is mentioned in a case and they only mention the husband or wife. So in cases where anatomy is not relevant, using inclusive terms like they and spouse allows all SPs to see themselves included in the story of this patient. And it also provides an opportunity when we're recruiting for that case for our unscripted diversity to shine. Another way that we on our site mitigate risk is to encourage proactive standardized patient mental health. At our site, we use pre-briefing, debriefing, and de-rolling to help SPs minimize adverse effects from participating in sensitive or potentially upsetting cases so they are able to walk away from the role after their session is done. Now, unscripted diversity. The main idea behind unscripted diversity is students interacting with real life actual people embeds and normalizes diversity within our SP program. Like I said earlier, if students are only interacting with SPs in the context of their social identity via case content, then they are being reduced to their identity only. That's when students start to think that every case that has a trans SP is about trans health. The patient's transness has then become pathologized. Embedding and normalizing diversity in everyday formative sessions like year one cardiovascular means that students are interacting with a diverse set of real people all throughout their medical education. Then when they meet the same folks in an OSCE setting, they are already familiar with them and they are less likely to think the case is specifically about their perceived identity. Basically, more interactions with visibly diverse SPs, equals more familiarity with these SPs, leads to seeing them as a full person, and then it means that SPs are less likely to be reduced to their perceived identities. At the CLRC, unscripted diversity depends on the recruitment methods of our SP educators. ASPE's Standards of Best Practice gives us some guidance for recruiting SPs in their section on safe work practices. Section 1.1.3 says, quote, screen SPs to ensure that they are appropriate for the role. 
For example, no conflict of interest, no compromising of their psychological or physical safety. And it also says the right SP for the right role at the right time, end quote. So this idea, the right SP for the right role at the right time, is paramount. And at our site, when a new SP is hired, who also, also happens to belong to a priority community, we offer them sessions at their skill level, and we aren't asking them right away to dive into a case that focuses on their social or cultural identity or deals with issues that may be upsetting for them. We are building them into the SP program and introducing them to learners as a whole patient first. A recent change I've personally made over the last two years is when I'm recruiting for an event where lots of learners, like every year one medicine student is participating, participating over the course of a single day, I will work hard to make sure there's enough visible diversity so that each student encounters a broad spectrum of patients comparable to what they'd encounter out in the community. And this brings up something that Christina and I talk about a lot. What about less visible differences? Aren't invisible disabilities, straight and cis passing queerness, white passing minorities important to see, to have in a fully diverse SP roster? Does it count if it can't be perceived? Well, when it comes to learners seeing themselves reflected in the SP population, and seeing SPs that reflect the community, kind of no. But when you have a diverse SP workforce, the benefits go beyond what you think you can see. It's about knowing that everyone has a seat at the table, everyone is invited to speak. Awesome. So a significant piece of this puzzle is how our human resource practices support or limit program development. Um, we've touched on how we recruit SPs for existing shifts, um, but I want to talk about how we find them in the first place, and then more importantly, how we keep them. So uh, word of mouth continues to be our most effective tool, but there are limitations with it. The biggest limitation, I think, that um, is that our social groups, like each one of our different social groups, um, tend to be filled with other people who are a lot like us to begin with. Um, and so for a long time, this program grew solely based on word of mouth, but it was a very homogenous group, um, like a bunch of retired teachers, for example. And these days we need to practice more deliberate and ongoing outreach within priority communities. And then once the ball gets rolling, word of mouth will work to our advantage again. But the first step is figuring out who isn't already sitting at the table. Um, an SP pool needs to have representation from all demographic populations. And um, when we discuss like the difference between priority demographics and priority communities, um, when we talk about priority demographics, we're really just talking about a demographic that we struggle to recruit. So the gaps in our patient population, um, and that could be a priority community, or it could just be like 45 to 50 year old men. So then we have to figure out where to find them, uh, like where do they go and hang out. So Kate and I, uh, we do presentations for organizations like Sask Abilities, um, the ITEP SunTEP program, the DSA has organized opportunities for us to speak um, as well. We hang posters, we hand out cards, we've done CBC radio interviews, uh, we use the USASC social media, and we've nearly exhausted our own social circles. There's literally no rock we aren't willing, excuse me, to turn over. The application form is on our website. Um, and then once I get an application, I just, I send them a seven minute video. It provides more information about the job. Um, and then there's the interview. And then once hired, that's actually where our work really starts. Um, in the past few years that I've been doing this job, I've learned two things about retention. First, once an SP gets past their probationary period, they generally only leave for one of maybe four reasons, maybe five. Um, they start as a College of Medicine student. It's a really popular one. Um, they get a new full-time job, so kind of the same. They're experiencing significant health issues. They move away, or sometimes they pass away. Um, so those are the only, the most popular reasons, I guess. 
Um, and then second, the single most important factor in getting them through that probationary period was how well we did at making them feel safe and welcome in the CLRC environment. You cannot fully integrate a casual employee if they won't take any shifts. And while it's true that some people just don't find it to be a good fit for them, it's far more common that we fail to onboard them properly. So that means knowing when their first shift is and meeting them at reception, greeting them by name, introducing them to the rest of our SP educator team and our simulation technician, Audra, who sits at the front, um, giving them a tour, uh, what else? Uh, introducing them to an SP or two so that they have someone to chat with uh, in the reception area. It's a very social atmosphere. So not feeling alone is really important. Um, and then making sure that they're not the only person from their community doing the session that day wherever possible so they don't feel tokenized. Using their names and pronouns, maintaining a scent-free facility, having bariatric gowns available, and then responding to whatever other needs for accommodations present themselves. In committing to these small changes, we are proactively building an anti-oppressive infrastructure where people um, experience less harm because they feel safe to report harm. They can express when they feel psychologically unsafe. And I think ultimately they know that we have their back. All right, so how do we know how we're doing beyond anecdotal evidence? When we are not used to seeing lots of diversity in our space, any amount can feel like, whoo, a giant success, we've won. So it's hard to know when we where we really stand unless we consult the data. We started collecting data in 2020 when we engaged in an environmental scan of our SP pool based on demographic information SPs had already provided us. We wanted to give ourselves a report card and look at which demographics were underrepresented. This SP census report used similar categories to what we're using now and would be valuable for us as a baseline to compare to as we move forward. Stats Canada provides us with useful demographic information about what the national and provincial population looks like, and we have tools to compare ourselves against those statistics now. Our new shift scheduling and database management system, ShiftBoard, allows us to run reports isolating demographic-specific data from all the SPs who have completed a self-declaration section on their profile. We used the visible minority groups from Stats Canada, and we also added Indigenous to Canada, Disability Community Member, and 2SLGBTQ community as options the SPs could select. At this point, we are reviewing our SP demographics annually, so when Christina does hiring, she knows where to reach out to work towards our diversity goals. Some lessons learned along the way. <clears throat> there are a number of reasons why a person that you see as a member of a priority community may not self-declare as such. They may not see themselves as a visible minority, perhaps in their country of origin, they aren't the minority. Some self-declaration terms are hard to define, hard to understand, and then there's also a looming fear that there, that there's going to be a negative impact on your work, on your shifts, when you maybe are recruited less or pigeonholed because you've self-declared. We've been clearing up a lot of these issues just by having nice one-on-one -on -one conversations with SPs to clarify the real purpose behind the self-declarations. And now also, if the goal is for every individual learner to interact with a diverse set of patients over their educational journey, we actually need to have diversity goals that surpass the provincial or national averages so that statistically, each student will have interactions that meet those provincial and national averages. At the same time, we need to be keeping an eye on our SP population so that we avoid excessive hiring practices. We strive to help SPs develop their skills, which means we need to scaffold the types of sessions they're recruited for, and a bloated SP population will not allow for us to do that thoughtfully. Okay, so what do we do now? Um, because the nature of SP programs does tend to be more on the transient side, uh, the challenge for us is sustainability. So. Um, historically, our relationships with Open Door Society, Global Gathering Place, and SASC Intercultural Association have resulted in many wonderful folks working with us simply as a temporary survival job. 
Um, and because we can't offer anyone full or even part-time hours, like consistently part-time hours, um, this job tends to be a gig, a side gig for folks who have other casual jobs or an interesting job for people for whom income is not a requirement, uh, which places them in a position of privilege. Maybe they're retired or maybe they have a partner at home who has enough income to support the household. We also have um, a lot of people in the theater uh, and arts community are well represented. It's a, like Kate and I found back in the day, it's a very good side gig in between um, contracts. But already I'm sure you're starting to get a picture of the challenges that we might face in building an SP population where everyone is represented. And I'm sure we can all agree that the nature of working within an academic institution means that there are problem solving measures that we can identify, but cannot or or maybe will not ever make happen. So, for example, um, let's say we want more women between 30 and 45. Um, it might be helpful to have an on site drop in daycare center. Um, because the lack of affordable childcare and just like the lack of childcare to begin with is um, certainly a very prohibitive factor for people within that age demographic. Um, building sustainability requires ongoing reflection. Are our values reflected in our practice? This work is never done, but how do we know when we've reached a point where the program can sustain it itself? Our um, strategies are sustaining themselves. Well, we keep looking at the data for one thing. Um, I think we said 41% of our SP population has indicated that they belong to one or more of the priority communities. They can pick as many as they feel reflect their identity. Um, we'd like to get that number higher. Um, but having an SP program, a simulated patient program, <laughs> uh, my job, I should say, um, coordinator, having them dedicated to, um, the work of human resource, the hiring strategies, it means that work can be championed. One person is accountable for it, and therefore it can also be scaled. Um, not only that, but the College of Medicine strategic direction, it does chart a very clear path forward for us um, where we no longer need to be subver uh, subversive, trying to kind of put these small changes in where they maybe won't have much impact or won't be noticed as much. We can start to lead with transformative change. So in conclusion... Developing a simulated patient population within an EDI framework presents a unique opportunity to enrich healthcare education by fostering a learning environment that reflects the community healthcare professionals will serve. By acknowledging the potential harms of scripted diversity and actively working to mitigate these risks, we can create more inclusive, respectful, and effective simulations. This involves not only careful consideration of content and context, but also a commitment to ethical guidelines, systematic training, active engagement with the communities represented. Ultimately, by engaging these considerations, we can empower future healthcare providers with the knowledge, sensitivity, and skills needed to provide equitable care across all demographics. And that uh, concludes our talk today. Um, so I think we have 10-ish minutes for questions. Um, if anybody has them, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, at this point, I think we can turn your video on if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll maybe turn it over. I don't know, Natalia, what happens now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I you've already made the call, but I always invite everyone to turn on their video so you can see that you have a lovely and appreciative audience um, who is tuned in and listening. Um, I am always just so incredibly impressed with, um, and I see Meredith said the same thing in the chat, but how thoughtful you are in this work. Um, I don't come from a medicine or even like a health sciences background. And so the first time that I talked to the both of you and set foot in the CLRC, 
I was just kind of amazed at how far that thoughtfulness carries um, and how many considerations there are. And we've had lots of um, interesting conversations going back and forth about the representation, but not tokenization. Mm -hmm. And there's all of these um, um, tensions in being able to do the work, but I think that you take that on um, in such a caring and considerate way. Um, and I'm sure that that has such an impact for the learners. Um, I haven't seen anybody post any um, questions in the chat yet, but I'll maybe start with a question for the both of you. What makes you most excited um, in kind of like new directions for this work or like what's what what's the exciting future? Where is that headed? Oh, really good question. <laughs> um, Kate, do you want to tackle that one first? Sure. Something that I'm really excited about for the future. Um, something that we are just starting to see the beginning of because we're finally getting enough uh, visible minority SPs in our SP pool is something that we talked a little bit about in the um, or mentioned briefly in the talk, which is not just having like one black SP in the case like if you've got four sps that you're all training on like a belly pain case or whatever and you've got one black person then if there's like any conversation about like what the scar is going to look like on the skin tone or if there's like some cultural aspect then the responsibility is solely on that one person and they might feel like oh god like i'm getting tokenized or i'm being like i don't even want to bring things up because they don't have any community here um, and so we're starting to see now we can recruit, okay, I actually have enough available, interested at the right skill level, SPs of color who can all be in this one case. And then it's not just like glaringly obvious that like they're the one person of color in the room. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see more of that in the future. That's brilliant. And I know, um, actually, I think Chrissy and I were talking about this, but when you say that you go where people are, I mean, you were talking about visiting some of like the black churches and stuff to put up posters. Um, and I think that that just demonstrates like a really extraordinary commitment to that. Um, okay, I see that Yemi has his hand up. Go ahead, Yemi. Yeah, sorry, uh, I can't put my my uh, video on, I'm driving. And um once again, uh, I want to re reiterate the, uh, the the thoughtfulness and the depth of the uh, uh, work that's, that you guys have demonstrated in your presentation and in the work that you do. Um, this is one one blind spot for me as a, as a practicing physician. Um, and um, you know I am a black man. And I recently traveled uh, back to Nigeria and tried to do some medical work. Um, and I had a challenge uh, setting an IV on a, yeah. on a patient because uh, I'm, I'm not used to setting IVs on a dark yeah. uh, tone skin patient any longer. Yeah. And uh, that that was a big surprise to me because I trained in that environment. Uh, one of my best skills when I was training was getting IVs even in pediatrics. And here I am, after just uh, not, being, not practicing in that environment for a while, I can. So, um, I, I mean, what, what, this, this, this work is very important. And um, the, the question I want to ask I think that's been alluded to how you get enough. I, I like the fact that you mentioned that you need to get uh, more people from priority groups than what the uh, uh, our demographics uh, uh, states, because again, you want to avoid tokenism. And the other aspect of that is, you know, if you're, if you're examining a, one patient, if, if 100 students have to examine one black patient, uh, abdomen, uh, by the time that person is done, they'll probably leave there with abdominal pain. So um, how, how do you, how difficult is it to grow the population of your SPs 
and um, uh, how can we help to, uh, to uh, increase that number? The other question that I would like to ask is, you seem to have about 41% of people of your SPs identify. How did you get 41%? That is a huge number <laughs> of people that are self-identifying. Uh, um, so, you know, what, what did you do there? Thank you. Okay, so I can answer both of those questions, I think. Um, the first question that you asked is, um, like word of mouth really is the most effective tool for us. And so like, for example, um, uh, we, in one of the photos you saw Yutunde, who is one of our SPs, but she's also just finished nursing school. And she has recruited two different individuals for us um, that are international students. And so like, that's, for one person, we've got two more SPs. And so how you can help is you can tell your friends and family and the ones that are maybe looking for extra work, um, have time. It has to be during the week, during the day, because it follows the school schedule. Um, but if everyone told someone, <laughs> we would double our SP population. Like that's just the way that the math works. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing um, on the 41%, keeping in mind that that is not necessarily um, visible differences. This is also people who identify as queer in, in some way. So it's all of the different areas that we would get them to um, declare. And um, a lot of the a lot of that difference you, you can't see, um, just that Kate and I know it's there. I guess our whole SP educator team, um, we know it's there because we we know these folks. So that includes any diversity that isn't visible to the student. And so talking with Kate, um, or what we said earlier about whether or not that impacts the student's learning, it, it doesn't really if they can't see it. Um, we could run some different numbers about who it, um, what the number would be if it was just people that who with differences that you could see, and it would be a lot lower. Well, uh, even in uh, even in, with with that, that is still high. And um, again, how did you get people to identify? That's that's my question. Whether it's visible or not visible, because it's it's one of those things that we we struggle with in this work. Uh, to get people to self-identify without, you know, the perceived uh, barriers, uh, potential ah, fear and stuff like that. So how did you work on that aspect? Thank you. I think it's the trust that we have with our SPs. And we've, we've had, like, we've literally sat down and had one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. Um, and I, I really just think that it's the, tr the trust that our whole team has built with these individuals that they mostly do feel safe declaring or self-identifying. That's the only thing that I can think of. Um, and we also, in, when we sent out messages asking them to self-identify and on the page itself where you self-declare on their shift board profile, it has an explanation about the purpose behind it, about this is about representing the community that these learners will be interacting with. This is about um, representation, having all the voices at the table. And the kind of person who wants to be a standardized patient, wants to have a bunch of abdominal exams, <laughs> uh, wants to have their ears poked at, all that kind of stuff, um, that is a kind of person who just is more likely to be invested in improving medical education for the benefit of every patient out there. And so they're already kind of thinking it like anything that's gonna improve patient care, anything that's gonna improve patient safety. And so when they understand the need for self-declaration as a part of that, I think that helps them buy in more. Also, Christina just hassles them. <laughs> she stands at the front desk, and every time someone walks by who hasn't filled it in, she just goes, hey, come see me at my computer. 
That's mostly because I, I want accurate numbers and it's mostly the people who haven't done it yet. There is a prefer not to declare. So people don't actually have to tell us if they don't want to. So. Uh, um, you've got a nice co uh, compliment in uh, the chat from Megan saying that your colleagues in Regina yeah. appreciate your leadership and the work that you do at the CLRC. So I'm um, certainly accept your flowers for that and then Carlin <laughs> had a question um she said how can we apply pressure to or convince the institutions utilizing this service to help uh, overcome some of the barriers you mentioned to recruiting and maintaining diverse SPs I don't know I mean part of that I think is um building in more scripted diversity will help because if there are cases that address these issues in a responsible and like community consultation kind of way, then that supports and pressures us to then make sure we have SPs who represent the communities in those cases. And it validates, like it names the diversity and uses the diversity that we do have. Um, and I, I don't know how it should get communicated to these institutions, but um, seeing representation in cases, seeing representation in the SP pool needs to be, I guess, maybe more underlined as a part of the learn, like a, a fulsome learning experience mm -hmm. for any health science learner. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed um, for us, there's been a pretty significant uptake um, in a lot of this of what we've been able to do since we started working with the Division of Social Accountability. And I think that that, um, I don't know, I just felt like a lot of before we were doing a lot of this because we thought that it was the right thing to do, but the DSA's existence um, formalizes those efforts and it makes them like really legitimate um, and part of like university mandates. And so that pressure has like given so much uh, lift to the work that we're, we were already doing. Um, and I wanna circle back cause I figured out what I wanted to say about what I'm excited about. Um, I'm excited uh, about this work moving into um, folks with disabilities. And um, I think we've been doing a really good job in the queer community and within um, like the visible minority communities, we've been doing a really good job, but we haven't seen as much success with folks um, in the disability community. And so I think that's where I'm, I'm kind of setting my sights now. I wanna see what kind of work that we can do in there to make it, the space itself accessible. Um, how do we support an SP who's hearing impaired, for example? Um, so I guess, we have a bunch of questions in in that and so i i think i'm just really excited to kind of get working on the answers i i'm excited for that work too that's a population that's near and dear to my heart this takes us perfectly to 1 30 so um i just want to again thank you both for uh, taking the time to present today um and I think that you've done such a phenomenal job of articulating the importance of this work. And I'm glad um, that we have the recording um, so that people who weren't able to join us today are able to listen in and to hear some of those thoughts. And I am I expect this to just catapult us even further. And there's so many things we didn't even get to talk about. I wanted to talk you know, <laughs> about the mannequins. We could have talked about the, the, the mannequins for the whole hour um, and the complexities. Of yeah, we could. Materials. Anybody is invited to come down. We'll give you a tour. Um, so yes, thanks to the both of you. Um, anyone who is registered for today's um, presentation will receive an email with a follow-up uh, survey to fill out um, in addition to a copy of the recording um, and any links or resources that were mentioned throughout the presentation. Um, and if anybody is interested in getting involved in the Art and Med Ed project, I'm also just going to um, pop a link in the chat here. Um, there's anyone is welcome to join us at any moment in time. Um, and you can also always reach out to me by email. 
I know part two in the making, we will definitely have to <laughs> have to keep that under consideration. Um, and yes, thanks again, everyone for joining us and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks everyone.